Welcome to Calvary Chapel Sneak Peek. We're so glad you chose to be with us today. Before we get started, we wanna share a few things about our church. If this is one of your first times visiting, we'd love to meet you in person. After the service, stop by the info counter in the lobby. Our connection team would love to say hi, answer any of your questions, and give you a free gift. At Calvary Kids, your children will learn about the gospel through worship, teaching, and fun activities. We believe it's not just child care, but a ministry that reaches out to kids and shows them the life-changing love of Christ. Calvary Youth meets on Wednesdays and Sundays and is a great place for middle school and high school students to connect with people their age and engage in worship, teaching, and small groups. These groups give them the opportunity to discuss the message, ask questions, and make long-lasting friendships. We believe that giving is between you and the Lord. We have offering boxes in the back of our auditorium and in the lobby. You can also donate through our website, the Church Center app, or by texting 84321. Your giving allows us to continue to provide a space for the church to gather and enables ways for us to be a movement of the gospel of Jesus. To stay updated about events happening around the church or to submit prayer requests, visit our website at calvarystp.org. Whether you're visiting for the first time or you've been coming for years, we're glad you're here and we're excited to worship with you. Our hope for today's service is that we can be a movement of the gospel of Jesus for all people. Good evening, everybody. I hope everybody's doing well. I hope everybody's having an okay week. If not, we're going to be sitting at the Lord's feet tonight and just kind of surrendering all to him and praising him for what he's doing, even when we don't see it. So my name is Joel, this is my wife Tiffany, and we've been here before, some of you may have seen us, some of you may not, but um, would you stand with us tonight? Let's uh, lift our voices, but let's pray and surrender this night to the Lord. God, we just wanna thank you for your grace, thank you for your love and your mercy. It is poured out every day new, and Lord, thank you that you are working even when we don't see it, God. Thank you that you love us more than we can even imagine, God. Tonight, as we sing to you, as we praise your name, and as we sit at your feet and hear your word, may you be glorified in and through it tonight. In Jesus' name. You sing with me. I search the word. I search the word. Better 
Sing this out. You turn morning. Oh, you turn morning to dancing. Turn shame into glory. You're the only one who can. You turn morning to dancing. You give beauty for ashes. You give beauty for ashes. You're the
your name, God, we sing and praise you, lift you up. Church, would you sing with me as we exalt his name? Sing, I exalt. As I exalt thee, oh, I exalt thee, oh, I surrender it all to you, Jesus, tonight. May we lay our sins, our burdens, God, our worries, our cares, our fears before the King of heaven, the King of earth, the King of kings, the Lord of lords, God. We surrender it all to you and exalt your name tonight in this place. Church, we said together in agreement. amen. You may be seated.
Well, it is good to be with you. <laughs> Listen, we're throwing off your game today, so all right. <laughs> well, it is good to be with you. Uh, Joel and Tiffany, uh, friends of mine, uh, got to know them a couple of years ago, and so just enjoy when they have the opportunity to come and lead and worship on a Wednesday night. So it's just a, just a real blessing, because it's, it's better than me doing it. That's <laughs> You're like, you're not saying much. I know, I know, I know. I got my joke out for the day, so there it is. All right, uh, Revelation chapter 8. Now, I know there's going to be a tremendous amount of questions about Revelation 8, so uh, we have an opportunity to enter the service, so if you're new with us, uh, you can text your questions in. Uh, some of you might have never read Revelation chapter 8, and, uh, or some of you are very much have very strong opinions about Wormwood, right? And don't worry, it's in the text, and we'll discover that as we go. But nonetheless, if you have questions at the end of the service tonight, you can feel free to text those questions in, and then I will do my best to give a response. No answers, guaranteed, but there will be a response nonetheless. And it might be, we've got to wait till chapter 11, so I'm just letting you know ahead of time. You're like, man, this is a big build-up of chapter 11. I know. Wait till we get there. We're so close, chapter 8. I mean, this is right here. It's only going to be another four months before we get to chapter 11, so it'll be great. All right, so here it is, Revelation chapter 8. If you have your Bible, you can make your way there. Revelation chapter 8. We're going to read the whole chapter. Uh, when I read it, um, it it's going to feel a little different unless you've read the context before it. So it's going to feel like we're picking up in the middle of a paragraph, in the middle of an addendum, uh, because it's going to be like, I, I am not sure what's happening. So, uh, But just you, once you follow along, you'll, it'll start to make sense. Uh, as we continue. All right, here it is. Revelation chapter 8, verse 1. When he opened the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven for about a half an hour. And I saw the seven angels who stand before God, and seven trumpets were given to them. Another angel who had a golden censer came and stood at the altar. He was given much incense to offer with the prayers of all God's people on the golden altar in front of the throne. The smoke of the incense together with the prayers of God's people went up before God from the angel's hand. Then the angel took the censer, filled it with fire from the altar, and he hurled it to the earth. And there came peals of thunder, rumblings, flashes of lightning, and an earthquake. Then the seven angels who had the seven trumpets prepared to sound them. Oh, the first angel sounded his trumpet, and there came hail and fire mixed with blood, and it hurled down to the earth, or on the earth. A third of the earth was burned up, a third of the trees were burned up, and all the green grass was burned up. The second angel sounded his trumpet in something like a huge mountain. All ablaze was thrown into the sea. A third of the sea turned into blood. A third of the living creatures in the sea died, and a third of the ships were destroyed. The third angel sounded his trumpet, and a great star blazing like a torch fell from the sky on a third of the rivers and on the springs of water. The name of the star is Wormwood. A third of the waters turned bitter, and many people died from the waters that had been become bitter. The fourth angel sounded his trumpet, and a third of the sun was struck, a third of the moon, and a third of the stars, so that a third of them turned dark. A third of the day was without light, and also a third of the night. As I watched, I heard an eagle that was flying in midair called out in a loud voice, Woe, woe, woe to the inhabitants of the earth because of the trumpet blast about to be sounded by the other three angels. Revelation chapter 8. So, Lord, as we look at your word once again, God, I pray that you would prepare our hearts, uh, Lord, for your, what your word is saying. But, Lord, that you would just give us a vision so bright and clear of, Lord, you ruling and reigning. Uh, God, that one day heaven and earth will come back together again. And we just look forward to that day. So, as we study your word tonight, would you just speak to our hearts, prepare us in the middle of the week. Lord, some of us might even say tonight that, hey, I think those things just happened in my life right now. Everything's bitter. And maybe for us tonight, middle of the week, this is for you to lift us up, encourage us as you send us back out. In your name we pray, amen. So a couple of points that we're going to talk about is this. The first one is God's response to his people. When you, at the beginning of chapter 8, verses 1 through 5, it's really a response. Something's happening where uh, he is dealing with some event that happened before chapter 8. So we're going to look at that in his response with this bowl of a censer with fire that he throws to the earth. Uh, so that's, that's interesting. So we'll figure that out. Second one is this, a God who warns people. When you look at the trumpets and you look at the bowls, which will come later, and you look at the seals, the question becomes, who is this message for? Like, I mean, what's the point of the trumpets? I mean, why couldn't it have been a clarinet? Or, or a, a piccolo, that sounds pretty piercing. Like, why a trumpet? What's going on? And what's the purpose, and what is he trying to communicate by blasting the trumpet? And then we get to the third point, is God's people in prayer. 
um, which ties a lot in with the first point. But let's, let's go at it. So the first point is God's response to his people. One of the things that uh, we learned early on is that the end of chapter 8, or the beginning of chapter 8, is the end to a set of series of what is called the seals. So there's these seven seals, they all open up, and chapter 8 is the ending of that, which is what you have. Then he opened the seventh seal, there was silence in heaven for about a half an hour. And so this seal that he's opening up, the seventh seal, there's silence, and then it kind of gives us a parenthesis. Oh, uh, and I saw seven angels who stand before God, and seven trumpets were given to them. But let's go back to the seals. Then another angel who had a golden censer came and stood at the altar. Now, this is picking up, and it's really important, that this is picking up on the fifth seal. Now, we have a slide here that kind of help us out what the fifth seal is. It says this, when he opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar. So chapter 8, does angels buy some altar? Chapter 6, he's telling us what the altar is. The souls of those who had been slain because of the word of God and the testimony they had maintained. So there's under the altar are those that have been slain. And what are they doing? They're praying. They called out in a loud voice. How long, sovereign Lord, holy and true, until you judge the inhabitants of the earth, those earth dwellers? And avenge our blood. So what you have in the fifth seal is that those that have been killed for not only what they've believed, but their faith in Jesus Christ and because of the testimony, God has under the, underneath the, the altar protection. He's, he's got them protected. And as he has them underneath the altar, they're calling out to God in prayer, saying, God, how long? Now, I didn't put the verse up here, but the next verse it talks about, verse 11, it actually says, uh, he goes, wait until the full number of them come in. So what do we have at the end of uh, the beginning of chapter 8? We have him dealing, we have him dealing with their prayer. Why do I know that? Well, look what it says. Chapter 8, verse 3, another angel who had a golden censer came and stood at the altar. What altar? I think it's the altar of chapter 6, because it's all fit inside the seals, he was given much incense to offer with what? The prayers of all God's people on the golden altar in front of the throne. So the altar in chapter 6 reappears in chapter 8. What happens is the angel comes up to it. He goes, I'll take those prayers from you. I got those prayers. Mix a little incense in there. We got a nice little ball. And I'm going to chuck it to the earth. And as he throws it to the earth, it explodes when it hits the earth. And what comes out of it? Well, what comes out of it is... Peals of thunder, rumblings, flashes of lightning, and an earthquake. Well, that's some prayer. So the question is, here, what is God doing? Why is he responding to the prayers right now when he told them in the fifth seal, you got to wait? Because the seventh seal is the finale. It's over. He says, you know what? They all came in. Since everybody's in, give me those prayers, mix up a little incense, Kopacham, and off he goes. And he blows up. A lot of people have a hard time seeing that. And they, but, but when you look at the seals, he says, I'm not going to do it till everybody's in. Then what happens? Everybody's in, so he says, now I'm going to do something. What is he going to do? He's going to arrive. Now, this is fascinating. What's happening here, let me show you the next slide here. This will be helpful. This cluster of earthquakes, flashes of lightning, and thunder. These are random things. What they are really tying into is Exodus chapter 19. When God shows up on Mount Sinai, like when he shows up and his presence there, get this, there were trumpet blasts. Oh, that's coincidence, right? No. Trumpet blasts, there was an earthquake, there was lightning, thunder, peals of thunder. All that description is from Exodus 19. Now, why is it in Revelation 4? What's happening there? Well, Revelation chapter 4 is the picture of God's throne. Exodus 19, this dark cloud came over Mount Sinai. And as this dark cloud was there, what happened was there was lightning, thunder, and earthquake. Revelation 4. Um, I saw God's throne, and there was flashes of lightning, rumblings, peals of thunder. In front of the throne, seven lamps were blazing. They are the seven spears of God. That's what the rest of the verse says. So the code is, when you see flashes of lightning, rumblings, peals of thunder, what is it? You're in God's presence. So the incense, God takes the prayers of God's people, a little bit of incense, mix it all up together, and what does he do? He issues judgment on the earth. Now, why I say this is a final scene 
is because this particular series of events always appears on the sixth or the seventh in particular, seal, trumpet, and bowl. Now you're like, okay, I thought they were all sequential. Well, <clears throat> they're not. What they are, they're telling a different story from a different perspective. Why do I think that? I, now I thought at one point they were all sequential. But here's my problem. They all end the same. And they're describing the same event. So what is there multiple times that something becomes finalized? It doesn't make any sense. So what I think is happening, look at it says about the, the, um, the seventh trumpet. Then God's temple in heaven was opened, and within the temple was seen the Ark of the Covenant, and there came flashes of lightning, rumbling, peals of thunder, an earthquake, and a severe hailstone. What's happening in, in these couplets of seven, seven seals, seven trumpets, and seven bowls, it is increasing with intensity. They're just doing it from different angles. The seals are for the believers. The trumpets are against those that do not believe. Now, where am I coming up with that? And then you have the seventh bowl, which is the magnification of God's presence. Why? Flashes of lightning, rumbling, peals of thunder, a severe earthquake, like no earthquake that's ever happened. It continues. There was such big hail that we've never seen it. The hail came down and just killed people. So as you continue through Revelation, you get a massive, intense picture of God's presence in dealing with judgment for those that have rebelled against him, that don't want him, that are sinning against him, that are hurting other people. All the injustice in the world, you see that magnifying through these sets of seven cycles of, of seals, trumpets, and bowls. So, okay, so the question is, as you think through that and you see it, how do I know this is increasing intensity? Well, with the seals, it says that a quarter of the earth will be affected. With the trumpets, a third of the earth will be affected. With the bowls, it covers everything. So you not only have an intensification of God's presence showing up, you have an intensification of quarter, third, whole. So what is God trying to communicate through these series of judgments? Whether you want to view them all chrono chrono chronologically as they're all sequential or they all happen at the same time, it's the same message. And what I think a lot of times people all they want to do is debate, do they are a straight line or they happen together? You're missing the point. It happens. How it happens in particular, I think a lot of people get, get hung up. And I know for a long time, for me, it was very challenging to, to, you miss the point because you're trying to strain on is it sequential or happening at the same time. Does it matter? There's an intense appearance of God himself showing up at the end of each of these three cycles of seven. And we know seven in Revelation is highly symbolic. So what is God trying to do with these trumpets? That's my second point. He's warning someone. The content of the trumpets, this is from Beale's commentary, focuses only on the effect of the various judgment on unbelievers. Now why do I think that about the trumpets? Because it actually tells us that in the trumpets. Let me show you. Next slide here. It says this. Then, this is the fifth trumpet then are they were told not to harm the grass of the earth or any plant or tree, but only those people. So harm, the locusts here. Harm only those people who did not have the seal of God in their foreheads. Where did we see the seal of God? Chapter 7. There's this 144,000 who has God's mark on them. He's saying, chapter 9, in the trumpets, there are those that have God's mark on them. Don't touch them. But who are the trumpets for? Well, he tells you. The end of the trumpets. The rest of mankind who were not killed by these plagues still did not repent of the work of their hands. They did not stop worshiping demons, the idols of gold, silver, bronze, stone, and wood, idols that cannot see or hear or walk, nor did they repent of their murders, their magic arts, their sexual morality, or their thefts. So the trumpets are a warning to who? To those that don't believe. The seals is showing God's protection in the midst of this judgment. The believers, as the judgment goes out, yeah, they're killed, they're persecuted. We learn about that in the churches. So what are the specifically are the trumpets trying to address? I'm not going to read the whole text. I'm going to read a highlight section of it. Is that what I believe it's trying to do with the trumpets, I think it is playing off the story in the Bible, in the Old Testament, of Jericho. Now, why do I think that? 
Let me read you just a sampling of Joshua chapter 6. Let me pick it up in verse 8. When Joshua had spoken to the people, all right, now look at the similarities. The seven priests carrying seven trumpets before the Lord went forward blowing their trumpets and the ark of the Lord's covenant followed them. Okay, now this is interesting. Seven priests, seven trumpets, and God's ark is there. Well, you're like, Ryan, where's the ark? Uh Aha, I know. It's in... It's at the end of the trumpets in chapter 11. It's fascinating. If you just go to chapter 11 real quick, the Jericho story matches perfectly with the trumpet stories. Chapter 11, the seventh trumpet, right? Verse 15, the seventh angel sounded his trumpet. Jump down to verse 19. Then God's temple in heaven was opened, and within the temple was seen the Ark of the Covenant. So let me get this straight. The Ark's there. Seven angels, now we have seven priests in the Old Testament, and seven trumpets are all there. And guess what else is there? A battalion of those in Israel lined up in battle formation, marching around the city. Where in Revelation have we been introduced to a group of battle battalion ranks? It's 144,000. The list of the 144,000, the closest, and I think Richard Bachman and Greg Beal are correct, I think the only list that comes close is that in the Old Testament where it describes a battalion of those going out to battle. That's the lineup in Revelation 7. So here's the point. The trumpets are modeled off the story of Jericho. God tells the people, I want you to mark around the city. When you march around the city, I want you the last time, I want you to march seven times around the city. Then I want you to blow your trumpets. I don't want you to take anything from the city. Then I want you to go in there and ransack it, but don't take anything. Well, obviously somebody takes something, plot twist, and it goes really bad for him and his family. He was aching for other reasons. So the question really becomes, well then, okay, you're saying that the trumpets are meant to be a warning to whom? When they were blowing those trumpets around Jericho, who were they warning? The people of Jericho. When God's blowing these trumpets, or these trumpets are playing out for us in Revelation, who is it warning? Well, you would, you would, you would, you would say they're, they're warning people. The trumpets are meant to warn in this case. Now, not every time in the Old Testament when trumpets are blown is it a warning. But when you have the ark, the battle battalion, the seven priests with the seven trumpets all blowing, there is no doubting that this is the story of Jericho and the trumpets are meant to be a warning to those that don't believe. Now, out of the story of Jericho, do you remember, though, who did believe? Was an outsider. Was Rahab the prostitute. She actually came to faith. And you know what? While those trumpets were blown, you know what? She wasn't harmed. Neither was her family. And so I think what's happening in Revelation is it's meant to jar us back to that God has sent out in commission those that have his mark on their body, on their life. And when they go out into battle, you will be up against the powers of darkness. Revelation 11, you'll find out in 12 in particular, you'll find about the fury of the devil that's coming head on towards you. And when you're in that battle and you're fighting the battle, some will lose their lives, but we are to use weapons. We are to use weapons that are not that of Jericho, swords, but we actually have a weapon that we are to use. It's prayer. We are to pray, speak to God, ask for his wisdom and insight, that he would not only pray that his will would be done in my life, but that we would see it done out in the lives of others, knowing that ultimately he is the one that brings the lasting judgment on everybody. Not me, not you. It's mine to repay, says the Lord, not ours. So what Revelation 8 is showing us is God's final judgment on those As it said earlier, the rest of mankind who were killed by these plagues still did not repent of the work of their hands. They're in rebellion. And what you have here in Revelation 8, Revelation 9, the trumpets, is God's replaying of the Jericho story in some way to show that he will be triumphant and he will win. Now, one other thing that's important about the trumpets that that, that it's, it's fascinating is that the trumpets, not only is it mar- uh, uh, st- taken off the story of Jericho, it's taken off another really big moment in the Old Testament. Remember, all Revelation is doing is repeating the Old Testament and bringing it to climax. It's bringing it to completion. That's all it's trying to do. It's taking all those Old Testament stories that you read through and you're like, what is that for? Oh, don't worry. 
it'll be all brought up in the New Testament and it'll be all fulfilled. And as you get to that spot, you see it all come to completion. So what do these trumpets, what else do they tell us? Well, look at the next slide here. It says this. The first trumpet corresponds to the plagues of Egypt. They're almost identical. So hear me out. The trumpets are judgment on Jericho, but in the same way that the the plagues of Egypt were judgment on Pharaoh and Egypt. So So the trumpets are really telling the perspective of the story of judgment. Why? The first trumpet corresponds to the hail of Exodus 9. The second and third trumpet trumpet corresponds to Exodus 7, the Nile becomes blood. The fourth trumpet corresponds to Exodus 10, darkness. The fifth trumpet corresponds to Exodus 10, locusts. So when you see these big locust creatures come in chapter, uh, chapter 9, see a lot of people, they're like, oh, okay, um, we got to imagine these huge locust creatures. They already showed up in the Bible, in the plagues of Egypt. So what are the plagues doing in the trumpets? Well, they're doing a lot of stuff. They are showing something. One of the things that, and, and we'll get more into it this, um, not this weekend, because I'm not going to be here this weekend, but next study in, in the trumpets, is that what the trumpets are really trying to get at, at the heart of it, it's saying in all of these, like in the plagues, God is over your God. If you think about it, in the story of the Exodus, when they were going to, and, and they were trying to be liberated uh, from, from Pharaoh, what happened? Moses and Aaron go to, the, go to Pharaoh and say, you got to let God's people go. He's like, no, I don't. So they take their staff, right? Remember, they take their staff and they throw it on the ground. It becomes a, a snake. And the magicians of Egypt are like, anybody can do that. They throw their staff and it becomes a snake. Then what happens? Moses' snake eats the other snakes. And you're like, what, what does that have to do with anything? It has to show to Pharaoh, hey, I know that you worship your God, but I'm over him. I'm above it all. And I will show my might by taking the created order, all these things that you worship, the sun, the Ra, which is the sun god, uh, 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 food, um, all these things, all these gods that you worship, the Nile was a god, and I'm going to show you something. I will beat that god down. I am god over all of it. Do not cross me. I, and, not that, and, and now he's not doing it in a prideful way, but he's showing his power over the other gods that exist. Okay, that's why in the trumpets in Revelation 8, what is he doing? He's doing the same thing he did to the, to the Egyptians. I'm the God over the, over the things, the idols of your life. I'm the God over all these things. I will not be mocked. And on top of it, I will have my judgment. I will have my way. I will do what I'm going to do to show my power and my might. And so not only do you have the story of Jericho, you have the plagues of Egypt. But listen, the plagues also in Egypt, they do one other thing. What they're doing is that when God created the heavens and the earth, right, out of the darkness, and he created in the six days, what are the plagues doing? They're undoing all the days of Genesis. To the what, what last one, where God takes life. What you have in, in, the, in the story of the, of the trumpets is creation is starting to unravel. Now, as I thought about that and thought through that, what I realized is that pretty much is how life is. Everything's unraveling. I mean, you can't even, like, I mean, I mean it's such a tragic thing. People can't even go to the grocery store without fear of being gunned down. I mean, when you look out in the world, do you see creation and other humans loving each other the way that they were designed to be? No. What do you see? You see other humans treating other humans not like humans. And you see them devolving, getting rid of the value that humans have. They're taking people's life. Why? You see creation unraveling on itself. And it's tragic. I mean, it's it's such a mind-blowing idea. I mean, God, why are people doing this? Why, if they're made in your image, why are they sinning against other humans? And so what happens is in the subtleness of not only how the enemy lies to us to say, oh, don't value those humans, you're better than them. I mean, all of that is, is demonic in the way that we don't value other humans, but we devalue them and treat them as other things. 
This is all of creation falling apart. And so when I look at the trumpets, and I look at the seals, and I see God's people having to just sludge it through day after day after day, I'm like, you know, we got it pretty good here in the world right now, but I can see creation falling apart. It's not, it's not, a, it's not a concept that I'm like, well, that's new. No, I see it every day. Now, what happens to disadvantage for us is, we have, uh, we have technology, which is a total gift, but at the same time, a total pain in the neck because it takes every problem and it brings us all to the forefront. We were never meant to handle that much information about that much tragedy in the world, but we have it. So it becomes so consuming because we're very empathetic towards others and it just, it's this vicious cycle that we get stuck in. All of that to say, the trumpet's creation unraveling as it's showing God's judgment on the world for their rebellion to him and to others. As all of that's happening, my last point is this. How should the church respond, or how should we respond as God's people? What caught my eye, you know, because you read chapter 8, and it ends with this uh, eagle saying, whoa, 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 we got three more trumpets to blow. You know what I mean? It's like, that rhymed. It didn't say that, but I just thought it rhymed. And more than likely, the eagle here could be a vulture, it could be translated vulture. I think a vulture saying, whoa, 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 is way more scary than an eagle. Because, man, you've seen vultures. Woof. So the question is, what are we to make of it? What I make of it is, I go back to the very beginning when the seals are handing it off to the trumpets. And in the middle of that transition time, there's this moment where... <laughs> There's this moment where the angel comes up to the altar and says, let me grab some of those prayers and some incense and put it all together. And I thought about that. What I, th- I got from the text is that we, as people, have a responsibility. We have a responsibility to pray. And that our prayers really, really, really matter. See, a lot of times when you see thing, everything unraveling, you're like, it doesn't matter. There's no way God could do this. It's impossible. And God's like, well, really? I could do something. It's our willingness to pray Pray on, on others' behalf, intercede, but also pray to God. And as we pray, we lift up our petitions to him. He hears them. What do I see in Revelation 8? God working, moving on behalf of the people. The people's prayers, the incense, which is all from Leviticus, by the way, which he thought, what's good in Leviticus? That's where this image comes from. It goes up to him as a sweet aroma, and he acts. So your prayers aren't wasted. But really, in the arsenal of the battle that's going forward, that's our greatest weapon going forward. We have God's word, but we also have a way to communicate to him, to come on our behalf, to help us in our life and on the life of others. I mean, to to underestimate the prayer here, I think it's it's just bringing it out and and bringing it out in broad daylight. And and so I think for me, how, how I respond is I look at God's word, I see the idolatry in my own heart, because listen, I'm just like you. I just, I just read a book about Revelation, it's all. We're the same. And I look at that stuff and I say, God, expose with a trumpet in my life the things that need to be rooted out, and God, help me to be in battle and on mission for you, using prayer as a weapon to help me forge through this life and not give up, and not just hit the escape button and get out. That's not what he's telling us to do. That's why the book of Revelation is to whom the churches, right? How do I know that? It's not a slide I have up there. It says this. I warn everyone who hears the words of this prophecy of this scroll, Revelation 22. If anyone adds anything to them, God will add to this person the plagues described in this book. And as he continues in Revelation 22, he says, this is for the churches. This is what this book is for. It, it, it's, it starts with the churches, and it says to the churches, listen, are you obeying him? And the idea is to spur them on, to spur us on, as we continue this journey in God's army, using weapons that are not, that we would know of, but the weapons that we use are for um, bringing this mission that God has us out into the forefront. That we're not alone, he's with us in the journey as we continue on. All right, let's pray together. So Jesus, we thank you for this night. Lord, we thank you for revelation. Lord, we thank you, Lord, that, that you do warn people, that there's our warnings are going off all around us. God, I pray that people would hear it. I know, I know in Revelation they don't repent, 
They refuse you. But Lord, you're warning them. You're showing your might and your power. God, you are un- allowing creation to be unraveled. And, and, and God, I, I pray people come to their senses. I pray that your Holy Spirit, which convicts us of sin, righteousness, and judgment to come, would speak to our hearts. God, I thank you, Lord, for your word. God, I pray as we continue this study in Revelation that you would, God, be drawing our hearts closer to yours. And, Lord, that we would, we would see your... And one day, God, that we pray that your kingdom will come, that heaven and earth will come back together again. That's what happens. That's the end of the story. God, give us eyes to see that day and that moment and help us, Lord. In your name we pray. Amen. All right, let's do some questions here. I already got a bunch of questions, so this will be a lot of fun. If um, you have any questions, there's a number on the screen. I know that there's some questions even I have here, and so um, this can be fun. All right, whoa, seven questions already. This is perfect. Okay, here we go. Now, this question, a very observant question, and what you're doing, um, you're asking, here it is, 2 Thessalonians 2, 10 through 12. Does this go along from Sunday's message and revelation? All of 2 Thessalonians 2, 1 through 17 really brings, really brings the picture together. So, yeah, so what you have in uh, Thessalonians, and I'll just kind of give you the, the overall summary, um, and Matthew 24 and Mark 13, you, you have um, these pictures that Jesus gives in Matthew and Mark, um, and then Paul helps the believers there in Thessalonica because they thought God had already come and they're, they're done for. And he's like, whoa, 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 hold on, hold your horses, let's just slow it down. Um, and he starts to help them understand about the day of the Lord and what it's like. Um, in, in the phrase, the day of the Lord, um, God's coming, um, that's all from the Old Testament. It's Old Testament imagery that Paul uses to kind of bring it all to completion. Um, uh, I, I'm not going to go through the Thessalonians passage um, but for tonight because we have all these questions. But yeah, there, 1 Corinthians 15, 1 and 2 Thessalonians, Matthew 24, Mark 13 are all pictures of the day of the Lord. Um, one of the things that you do find when you read the Bible uh, is that all of it does harmonize they say it a little different, uh, but it, it all actually fits together. Um, and they bring up different nuances from different scriptures in the Old Testament. So Revelation is not the total of all the things that are happening at the end, but it gives you a lot of them. Uh, Paul brings out other nuances that you don't see in Revelation, per se, about those that have fallen asleep. God's not slow in his promises. And so you, you have different things, and, and that's part of um, putting all those stories together. You get this beautiful picture uh, of the end. But Primarily, we're in our text in the book of Revelation. So there you go. That's not a good answer, but I did it. Okay. But will one third of everything, with one third of everything destroyed, what fills the space? Is it a void as it was in the beginning? You know, that's a great question. You know, I, I thought through, uh, this is really helpful. What Revelation does, it, it's, it's symbolic that has meaning underneath it. So what a lot of people do in Revelation, they do one of two things. They take all of the imagery and they say it's all not symbolic. Okay, you've got a big problem if you do that. Because you have a dragon coming out of the ocean in chapter 13. So do you think that there's a literal dragon coming out of the ocean? Loch Ness Monster? I'm just saying, at some point, you have to interpret the image. You're like, no, 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 that's Satan. It doesn't say it's Satan, it says it's a dragon. Is it a dragon or is it Satan? So at some point when you're understanding Revelation, people will fault either one side or the other. Oh, it's all literal, and because it's all literal, the illustrations right here, we're going to try to make it. At the other side, you have people say, well, it's all symbolic, symbolic, so none of it's real. That's not true. The symbol has meaning underneath of it. That's how symbols work. So, if you're reading the Psalms on your daily reading, and you come to the phrase that our God is like a rock... You're like, well, is he, is he what rock? We can play a mineral game. Uh, is he um, gold, silver? What rock are you, God? Let me get, you know, I, I, what kind of rock is he? Well, you missed the analogy. Or it talks about in Psalm 1, about those that are planted by the stream. So to really be a righteous person, I need to go put my feet into a river so I can be planted like a tree. I'm a tree. No, that's not what it's saying. The tree is an example of what it's like. 
So you wouldn't say, well, all of that has to be literal, would you? Why? It's poetry. So when you come to Revelation, this is an apocalyptic, which means to reveal, but the imagery that's there, what it's meant to do is to stir in you, to stir up what is underneath it uh, literally. So you have a couple things. It could be spiritual. It could be actual literal things. Like, so when you get the wormwood, is it an actual meteor? Or there's this other really great other explanation from the Old Testament that makes a lot more sense. Uh, when, it, when, when, for instance, when, it, when a third of the sun goes dark, think about it. If the third of the sun goes dark, don't you think we'd freeze to death? I'm just saying. We need a lot of light, and we could cause some major shifts in something. But why is it, think about this, a third, a third, a third. The seals, a quarter, a quarter, a quarter. The bowls, a whole, a whole, a whole. It's to intensify. So what, what I would do, like for instance, if I were to say to you, man, I'm at 100%. You're like, what does that mean? Well, I'm at 100%. Well, what's 100%? Like, do you have like a meter on you? Like, how, how do you measure that? Like, is it your temperature? Like, no, no, I'm at 100%. What's, what does that even mean? It, what we would know is that the percentage represents I'm whole. If I say, you know, I'm only 50% today, what would that mean? Well, I better stay away. You probably got the flu. What do you mean you're 50%? Well, I'm only 50%. 50% good or 50% bad? What happens is I can communicate real events through symbols. So I think the one side, my personal humble opinion, I think the one side says it's all symbolic, so it's not all real. That's not what it is. The other side says it's all, it's all literal and there's nothing symbolic except for the dragon that comes out of the water. And then he, this woman that rides the beast who's got seven horns, how does he actually even see? I, okay. So the question is, how are we to interpret the symbols with the literal meaning underneath? <laughs> and it's really complicated. That's all I'm saying. It's so complicated. Why? Most of the images are from the Old Testament. So interpret them in light of the Old Testament. That's the first rule. Right? We interpret Scripture with Scripture. But a lot of people that I hear, they take Revelation, they say, the Old Testament doesn't matter. I think the locust is a helicopter. You're like, well, wait a minute. I thought it was from the plagues of Egypt. Well, well what is the locust? Well, I do think it's something. But, but what, we're, not, we're not there yet, so I can't talk about the locust. But the question is, what does the symbol represent? We do it all the time. The Bible does it all the time. But people start wigging out when they get the revelation. It's a helicopter and meteor, obviously. Maybe. It could be. Or it could be famine. That's another possible thing. When the horse that rides out and he's got scales in his hand, what is he going to do with his scales? I'll hit you with my scales. What is he doing with it? It is a symbol of famine. When, he, when, a, when the horse is, is let out because the angels are holding the four winds of heaven, the four horsemen back, and they're released. And he's like slicing people. You're like, what? what is this? It's, it's bloodshed and conquest and famine and death. There's a pale horse. He's not made for the glue factory, right? Where is he going? The horse represents, it's a symbol of death. So what, what I'm saying is, is that it's, it is very hard to understand. Well, how do I understand the symbol? Is it literal? Is it symbolic? Both sides make errors. I make errors in it. And it's careful reading, looking at the Old Testament, looking at other things, and be willing to say, I could be dead wrong. But that's okay. Because what I do know it's saying is, God's going to unleash some major trumpets, and people are not going to like it, and they're going to rebel against them. We could all agree on that, can't we? So the thing is, look for the commonality of agreement. So all that it to say is, like, a lot of it, the third, it, it's so hard. Even for myself, I read it, and I'm like, I, I just... I, what, what is actually happening here? And, and so my big takeaway is there's judgment. At the same time is I, I always like, well, what could this be? And so I, I, uh, it could it be a literal thing? Well, it could actually be that. So that's, that's kind of how I, I, I wrestle through all that. You're like, that didn't help. Okay. Hi. Will people in earth realize this is God's warning, or possibly blame this on an idea such as climate change, earthquake, hail, fire, bitter waters, etc. Also, will Christians be here at this point? Okay, very, very insightful question. A couple things is, I think that some of the things, like for instance, uh, natural disasters and things like that, um, in, in, our, in our story, in the last uh, 20, 30 years, um, 
9-11 was a really big moment where a lot of people came back to church, but then they all left again. Uh, and so what happens is crisis do have a way of waking people up to that, that their life is short, um, that bad things happen in the world, and there's got to be some higher power out there, and it just can't be me. And so I do think that those things shake people, but does it convince them that they actually then by faith believe in the God of the Bible? That's a big, that's a big, big jump for a lot of people. And so I do think that these things that shake up the world uh, actually bring to light these things. And I think they happen all over the place all the time. I don't think they're just limited to just the end of the story of Revelation. I think God has been waking up the world through, through some of these things. Um, and so, yeah, I, it's, that's a great question, though. I mean, will people realize? Well, it says in the trumpet that they don't. Now, now some people think that this is a very, very specific time because it's all sequential. And that's why I said I, I just scratched my head because when I see the sixth and seventh trumpet, the bowls and the seals all in the same with an earthquake and God's presence. It, and when we get to chapter 11, it's going to say God's kingdom has come. Well, how could it come in the middle of the book? It just doesn't make any sense unless... The story of Revelation is from Christ's ascension to his coming. And what you do is you have cycles. They go like this. They go whoop. They, they touch this. They touch it. They go right back to the ascension. Why? Revelation chapter 12. What do you see? Christ is being born. Because like, in chapter 11, you have this moment. And it's like whoop. Right back to the beginning. So they're called, the technical term is recapitulation. And a lot of people are like, no, it's not doing that. Well, how do you explain it? How do you explain the Ark of the Covenant at the very end and God's kingdom is set up in chapter 11? So when I get to chapter 11, a lot of this is going to start making a lot more sense. And this is my, like I said, this is, out of two years of study in Revelation, this is the best of what I believe the Scripture is saying in light of the Old Testament, in, in my humble opinion. But, but that's the thing. I mean, I could be wrong on it, too. But at the same time, it does make a lot of sense on how these cycles work. So it, it is fascinating. So when we get to Revelation 11, you'll, we'll talk more about... Um, We'll talk more about Christians in there because there is, there is some really helpful insight into that. So I'm making it worse, I know. Okay, do the bull seals and trumpets happen in sequential order or at the same time? Well, I guess you already answered it. Yep, no, I'm just kidding. Yeah, I, 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 it's true. I, I think, like I said, at first, I thought they were all sequential, like the trumpets hand off to the seals, but after reading it, I think of this. I read a really large church history book called The Story of Christianity. And what happens is you, he goes forward, and then he has to jump back to give you another perspective from a different place. So that's how history is read. He can't say, there was a bowl, a trumpet, and a seal. It sounds like a beginning of a bad joke. They all went out to the bar. You know, it's not, it, they're not, he says, okay, there are six, there's, <laughs> there's seven of these seals, seven of these trumpets, seven of these bowls. There's, there's three of them. And when you put them all together, this is God's total and final judgment. Oh, don't forget about the seven clasps of thunder. That's in Leviticus. That way he's like, don't write about that. You're like, what, John, what are you talking about? Which comes from Leviticus. That's like the book of the day. Anyway. Um, yeah, and, I, and so I would just encourage you, think through that. Like, I know that might be a new idea, but just, just prayerfully just read Revelation uh, in some sense to say, maybe this could be all the same. Like I said, I could, I could be wrong, too. Okay, the center of coals sounds like the Day of Atonement in Leviticus 16. Is there a connection in that instead of the mercy seat or the footstool is being purified with the blood and coals? Um, the altar in specific here, um, it, I forget, uh, there's all these altars on the temple. And when I did Revelation well, 6, I did talk about which altar it was, I think it is, but I don't, I don't have that right now. Um, there, there is a lot of allusions to the altar in the Old Testament, and some people say, is it the altar where the sacrifices were made? Is that where the altar is in uh, Revelation 6? And some people say, no, it's a different altar. But it, 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 yeah, in that message, I, I think I, I gave some more, more examples of that, but, but I'm not, not 100%, um, 100% sure. Okay, in Revelation 3, where did the incense that was given to the angel that also received the prayers of the saints come from? That's a good question. But think about it. What he's doing, what happens when you mix incense and prayers together? What do you get? Some flavor of potpourri, right? No. What, you get incense and prayers. What, what, what does incense represent? 
it was, when they burned a sacrifice, they burned incense with it. Why? So that it would be a pleasing aroma to God. Because God only likes stuff from Bed Bath & Beyond, right? Obviously. So he wants his incense burned with the sacrifice. But here's my question. When you have incense and prayers and you mix them together, what is it? I'm calling out to God. I got incense being burned time. It's the sacrifice that I've made. Nonetheless, though, what are they doing? How long, O oh Lord? We got killed and butchered down here. What the heck are you doing? Help us. Avenge our blood. They're praying that with incense together. It's modeled off the Old Testament in the sacrifices that were made. And so what you have here is it both comes up. The question is, where did it come from? Well, I mean, remember, too, Revelation is in God's throne. It's in God's space. That's why you have to understand it symbolically. John was caught up to heaven. Revelation 19, heavens open up. Jesus on his white horse with his big sword and his, all his tattoos. He runs out of heaven. He comes out of heaven with his army. But from 4 to 19 is all pictured from heaven's perspective. So they're like, let's throw this thing down to the ground. Well, it's not in the sky throwing it down. It's from God's presence. Do you think that's up above the, the atmosphere? Th that's what he's saying. I'm in God's throne room. Where's that at? It's not past Saturn. Where's it at? See, we, we think in distance, well, he's up, John's up there, and he's, he's, he's there's the earth down here. The, the whole point of the whole Bible, from Genesis onward, is that God's space, wherever that's at, and I think the best way we understand it is like dimensions, except for Marvel totally jacks all that up, but dimensions, and then you have earth, and the space is overlapped. Then sin happened, and whoop, they came undone. But then what God does is, hey, I'm going to come down on this mountain, and earthquakes, and my presence, and Moses goes up, and he says, I just saw him. He's up there. Well, that's his space. When you look at all the temple furniture, what does it all represent? You know, like, oh, there's like, there's these pomegranate trees, and then there's these flying creatures. What is it? Heaven, pomegranate trees, earth, God's space, cherubim figures, earth, pomegranate trees, together. Where did you have angels and pomegranate trees together? The Garden of Eden. So what the Bible is constantly showing us is heaven and earth together, constantly, so when Revelation 4, he's in God's throne room. Then Revelation 5, he says, who's worthy to take the, the scroll? Uh, Jesus says, I got it. He takes the scroll. He's seen all of this from in heaven's perspective. Then he's like, I got some incense and some prayers. Chuck it to the earth. And you're like, well, earth, so it has to be literal. Hold on. He's throwing this thing down, and what do you have? Heaven and earth, a scene of it coming together. And there's plagues that happen. Just like it happened in Egypt. So there's something literally happening. More than likely, my opinion on these plagues, they're famine. So a third, a third, a third is to talk about destructive nature of, God, of, of this famine being unleashed on the earth. So I think that's, the, that's the, this, the thing underneath it. I don't think the symbol should be just thrown away. So that, that's, that's, I'm giving you way too much of my opinion, but that, that's what I think it's talking about. Okay. I'm surprised no one asked me about Wormwood. Oh, look, I only got a couple more minutes left. Woof. Okay. Are the 144,000 the only believers left on the planet at the time? Okay. The 144,000. Let's go back there. Revelation 7 real quick. Okay. So um, now this is fascinating. Revelation 7 verse 3. Do not harm the land or the sea or the trees until we put a seal on the foreheads of the servant of our God. Okay. Revelation 9, which we didn't read tonight. Don't harm anybody that has the seal. And don't harm the grass. Like the grass. What is it, St. Augustine? Don't touch my grass. Like, What's going on here? Why not burn in the grass? Don't touch them. Don't touch them. Okay? I would assume it's the same people with the same seal. Unless God's got different seals for different people, it seems like it's the same group he's talking about. Okay. So then I heard a number of those who were sealed, 144,000, from all the tribes of Israel. And you're like, oh, this has got to be Israel. Okay. Okay. Is does Revelation mention the 144,000 at any point in time? Again, it does. It's a spoiler. <laughs> Revelation 14. You're trying to, see, I'm trying to memorize Revelation all the chapters. If I could, I'm getting close. Oh, look at that. I got it right. Okay. 144,000. Then I looked. There before me was a lamb standing on Mount Zion, and with them 144,000. They're back again. Is it the same, or is it a different 144,000? It's the same. Who had... 
his name and his father's name written on their foreheads. So do you want to know what's written on your forehead? His father's name. His name and the father's name written on your foreheads. Can you see it? It's invisible. Special black light, sign, you know. Anyway. And then I heard a sound from heaven like a roar of rushing waters and a loud peal of thunder. There's the thunder again. God's presence. The sound I heard was like a harpist playing the harps. And they sang a new song before the throne and before the four living creatures and the elders. No one could learn the song except for the 144,000 who had been redeemed from the earth. Okay. These are those who did not defile themselves with women, for they remain virgins. They follow the lamb wherever he goes. So he redeemed the 144,000 from the earth. That language of redeeming those from the earth, go back to Revelation chapter 5, it happens again. Revelation chapter 5, verse 9. There's a group of people singing a new song. You are worthy to take the scroll and open its seals because you were slain, and with your blood you purchased for God persons from every tribe, language, people, and nation. You have made them to be a kingdom and priests to serve our God, and they will reign on the earth. So Revelation 5 says God purchased a group of people. Revelation 14, the 144,000, where were they redeemed from? The earth. God purchased people from the earth. Is it the same group? My consensus is that it's the same group. Every tribe, tongue, language, and nation is the 144,000. Why? God redeemed them. Revelation 14, from the earth. Revelation 5, God redeems a group of people. So is there multiple groups of people? Now, what I'm not saying is how Israel fits in all of this either. So just, I'm trying to stay out of that quagmire, because I do think they fit, but I'm just trying to draw the analysis from Revelation from the text. 144,000, God redeems a group of people, they, they show up again in chapter 14, they have a seal on their head, in the trumpets, right? They got a seal on their head, and he says, don't touch them because they got the seal. Ephesians says, you're sealed with the Holy Spirit, so I'm like, two plus two, could it equal four? And so my opinion is, based on those series of verses, that it's the same group. Like I said, I could be wrong on that, but that's what I, that's what I think it is. Okay, somebody asked me about word more, but we're almost there. Okay, uh, what advice would you give to someone who says he doesn't want to be married anymore? Whoa, I should have read that first. Okay. Yeah, that's a tough question. Um, I got three minutes, and I got wormwood. Um, okay, what I would say on the married thing, I don't know if I could really do it justice by answering it up here. So what I would say is the best thing to do, if you're watching online or here in the room, I've, it's just somebody for the first time that texts this question in. What I would do is just call the church. We just love to talk with you. Uh, if you want to come and talk with Pastor Dave, he's not here tonight, so I'll volunteer his services. But, but we'd love to just kind of work through with it because it's probably a lot bigger story than what I can answer through a text message. Um, um, and, and just I, I want to give it justice and not, um, and, and not answer it really well. So I encourage you, please call the church, and let, let's, we'll, we'll talk and uh, work through that. Um, that that's, a, that's a tough question, deep question there. Okay. Hi, is Wormwood, i got a couple minutes left, is Wormwood the same reference as to C.S. Lewis's book, Screwtape Letters? I think that C.S. Lewis did borrow it. But I'm not 100% positive on that. Uh, real quick on Wormwood, if you want some interesting scriptures on Wormwood, that's really helpful. Um, when you go to, um, the name of the star is Wormwood, and a third of the waters turn bitter. Uh, this is a very interesting thing, so I'll try to do this uh, uh, somewhat quickly. Um, in the second trumpet, you have a mountain that's on fire that falls to the earth. Well, that's odd. A mountain falling from the earth. In the book of Jeremiah, chapter 51, listen to what it says. Before your eyes, I will repay Babylon and all who live in Babylonia for the wrong they have done. In Zion, declares the Lord. I am against you. You destroying mountain. Jeremiah says that Babylon is a mountain. You're like, what? So he's personifying Babylon's a mountain. What are mountains in the Bible? It's the meeting place. It's, a, it's, it's like a holy temple. That's what mountains represent. You who destroy the whole earth, declares the Lord, I will stretch out my hand against you, roll you off the cliffs, and make you a burned out mountain. So a mountain that's on fire. Huh. There was this mountain that fell from the sky. Let me read the end of Jeremiah 51, verse 63. When you finish reading the scroll, tie a stone on it and throw it into the Euphrates. Then say, so will Babylon sink to rise no more because of the disaster I'll bring on her and the people will fall. 
After I'm done, tie a scroll and throw Babylon as a mountain into the water to sink. Okay, what does the trumpet say? Something like a huge mountain, all ablaze, was thrown into the sea. Could it be what Jeremiah is talking about in Jeremiah 51? I think it is. Who is personified as the one being thrown in the sea? Babylon. Who's the bad guy, the bad city in Revelation? Babylon. Jeremiah is saying in the trumpets, God says, I threw Babylon to the ground. Okay, well, that's interesting. Then you get to the wormwood part, right? And wormwood is, look at this real quick here, and I'll finish. I know I don't want to go over time here. It says this, the third angel sounded his trumpet, and a great star blazing like a torch fell from the sky on a third of the rivers in the springs of water. The name of it is Wormwood. Fascinating text of scripture. You can look it up. Isaiah 14, 12. How you have fallen from heaven, morning star, son of the dawn. You have been cast down to the earth, you once who laid low the nations. It's a reference to Satan. But you know how it's referenced in Isaiah? As the king of Babylon. So what I think the trumpets are doing is personifying Babylon is what will be brought low. The great city that everyone worships. And Babylon is very much alive today. It's not just at the end of Revelation. It is continuing on. Babylon's throne of the earth. But who is personified in Isaiah? It is Satan. When you get to Revelation chapter 12, what do you have? You actually have a picture of Satan being thrown to the earth. So I think what the trumpets are saying is, like Babylon in Jeremiah is this character that rails against God. He will be thrown into the earth and thrown into the sea to be ever for abolished. He is the great mountain of the trumpet, but he also, when he falls, he will turn things bitter. That's what wormwood is. It means to, it's bitter. It comes from Jeremiah, actually. Uh, Jeremiah 9.15, Therefore, this is what the Lord Almighty, the God of Israel, says. See, I will make this people eat bitter. It's the Hebrew word for wormwood. Food and drink poisoned water. God is going to bring some crazy judgment on the earth. That's what he's saying. So like I said, whether it's sequential or it all stacks up together, whether they're all literal events or they're all symbolic events, what we know about Revelation is that God is going to put judgment forward. It's going to fall on everything and everyone, and those will stand up to him and say, no. And he goes, I'm the God over all things. I created you, and my will will be done on earth as it already is done in heaven. Let's pray together. So, Lord, we thank you for this time. Lord, we thank you for your word. And, Lord, I just want to lift up the one person that texts the question about their marriage. I, God, I know that life is filled with tremendous amount of sorrow, pain. Uh, God, Lord, also, there's really hard decisions to make. Uh, Lord, but I pray that tonight, Lord, uh, that you would speak through our hearts. You would encourage us, Lord, and that person would reach out. And, God, Lord, that all of us, Lord, would, would have people in our life that we have, we have true community where we can share our struggles, but also, Lord, that you would come beside us and you'd love us through it. In your name we do pray. Amen. Amen. Well, you guys have a tremendous night. Uh, one of our elders, Phil Dickhouse, will be teaching this weekend, and then I'll be back uh, with Revelation chapter 9 in two weeks. Lord bless you guys.